Well, Ocean and Climate sounds perfect for me to ask this burning question of whether this is going to be possible next year to set a new record. I've been at sea, I've done six laps of the planet now over the last 20 years, and I'm starting to see changes. But my question is, am I really seeing changes? Is it significant? Is it changing things? And I'm hoping you're going to answer these questions. Welcome back to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast, where we talk to the people leading the way in raising the profile of the ocean through research, exploration and advocacy. We hope you enjoy today's episode. I'm Dee Kafari and I'm a professional sailor and a proud ambassador here at NOC. I've got a burning question though. Next year I'm embarking on a new challenge to do a speed record around the world, the Jules Verne record. At the moment, it stands at 40 days, 23 hours and 23 minutes. It's held for seven years. Many have tried and many have failed. We're going to go ahead next year with an all-female team. But the question I have is, is it even possible? So I've come here to ask the experts and I'm proud to say I'm joined by Dr. Ben Mote. Ben, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, so I'm Ben Mote. I'm... Uh here at the National Oceanography Centre. And my background is I've, well, I've been here since around 1995 when the Institute was set up. And I've led sort of expeditions on our research ships into the North Atlantic, South Atlantic. And I've been into the Southern Ocean, Indian Ocean. I haven't yet been into the Pacific, but um, perhaps one day. <laughs> There's still time. There's still time, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and it's sort of my primary research is really on sort of um, the interactions between ocean currents and the, these ocean transports of, of heat and its interactions with the atmosphere and really the role of the ocean in climate. Well, ocean and climate sounds perfect for me to ask this burning question of whether this is going to be possible next year to set a new record. I've been at sea, I've done six laps of the planet now over the last 20 years and I'm starting to see changes but my question is Am I really seeing changes? Is it significant? Is it changing things? And I'm hoping you're going to answer these questions. <laughs> well, the things are definitely changing on our planet in terms of the ocean currents uh, are, are perhaps slowing down. And also the, the, the weather systems, you know, we've got more energy in, into the atmosphere. So your, your challenge is that when's that going to start? That's so we look to leave the window of opportunity is October to February because we want to be in the Southern Hemisphere summer to get the best weather of the Southern Ocean. So it's not all doom and gloom, although I don't think it really feels like that when you're down there. We're going to be in a 100 foot trimaran. So it's three hulls, super fast speed, semi foiling. You know, it's all about performance and we're looking at weather. We're looking at weather forecasts to have that confidence in the forecast to get as far as possible when we start. The start line is at the Ushant Lighthouse uh, in the north corner of France and we're hoping for that 10-day forecast to give us confidence that we'll get to the bottom of the Atlantic ready to enter the Southern Ocean and then it's a little bit of pot luck. So we always look at ocean currents to help us and the, the weather playing into our favour to be at the optimal boat speed. To make that record we have to manage 26.7 knots average right average. across around the whole planet yeah so what's the top speed you can actually well we we've had the, we had the boat up at above 30 but it's it's about sustained consistency and not the peaks and yeah. troughs and also i've really learned that wave height is really significant when we're planning and routing these boats in the ocean so if i take you on a step-by-step -step kind of tour of the world and some of the changes and the hazards i'm seeing maybe you can explain them to me I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so initially we leave the North Hemisphere, uh, go down the Atlantic, and a lot of the cruising boats we've noticed are experiencing an increase in mammal activity. And it's called Orca Alley as you go down the Portuguese coast and often into the Mediterranean. Now I'd say before lockdown, that never existed. We didn't really see orcas. And now we're not only seeing them, but they're starting to interact with the boats and at some times causing catastrophic damage that sinking boats and families are having to abandon. What do you think the cause of that is? As a science community, I think the simple answer to that is we don't know yet, I would say. But what we are seeing planet-wide planet is um, we're seeing sort of uh, movements of species because the ocean is getting warmer. 
you know, we've heard of coral bleaching, you know, that yeah. is down to sea surface temperatures increasing and also the pH of the ocean is changing. Um, so we're getting species are moving into, into newer waters. So maybe these orcas are actually changing their habit, habitats and moving. But it is, it is interesting, isn't it? Because you think of mammals, really, they would maybe defend their young or maybe feeding habits that defend territory. So why they should attack attack boats is is a bit challenging. We don't know. Yeah. You know, because in lockdown, we I was there in sort of March 2020 in the, in the similar area, and then back in later that year in December and January into 2020, 2021. But we were on a one of our hundred meter uh, research vessels with steel hulls. So um, you were yeah. of less less interest. Less interest, but um, but I, I saw some of the clips actually, and it is it looks absolutely frightening. Really, yeah. you know, some of the time they were coming up, coming along, and maybe scratching their noses on on the boats, but other times actually atta physically attacking them, weren't they? Yeah, that's right, and it, it doesn't seem to be size specific or location specific. It's definitely expanding. I mean, one thing we're hoping for is we're going to be too fast for them and they'll lose interest. What's the kind of speed of an orca, do you know? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. Yeah, yeah. But hopefully but, we won't be too close to the coast as we go down. Yeah, but if you're doing 26, 30 knots, surely you can outmaneuver them perhaps quite quite quickly yeah. if, you can, if you can see them coming. <laughs> so we, we head down the Atlantic and we negotiate our wildlife. We go through the doldrums. Hopefully a window of opportunity arises that we don't even notice the doldrums being there. That's the plan. You go through Fingers the crossed. least activity. And then we basically skirt the Brazilian coast because we've got that nice big high pressure in the middle of the South Atlantic. So even though we're going to go down the bottom and turn left, and I have to remember that as somebody who's gone down and turned right, um, we go round that high pressure and we head into the Southern Ocean. Now, in 2005, 2006, when I was heading round the world the wrong way, my average wind speed was around 50 knots down in the Southern Ocean, and I was down there for a long time. Now, I look at the Vendée Globe and I watch them and I follow them and... Just in 2020, in the last edition, they were in the Southern Ocean and Christmas Day, it was 15 knots, it was sunshine. They just don't seem to be having the extreme weather that I experienced. Yeah, because typically, you know, we see these atmospheric patterns. So um, if what, when what we're experiencing probably since about 1980 is actually an increase in the, in the, in the winds in the Southern Ocean and they're potentially hugging more towards Antarctica. So they've Con, you know, condensed a bit towards Antarctica and they've sped up. So that's an interesting observation. And and in general, when we look at the Southern Ocean, we think more that the winds have actually slightly increased, perhaps, but definitely not dropped. So whether whether the wind or the time of year you're there, maybe it, it's just natural variability where you're just perhaps unlucky, or they've been unlucky or not. Mm. So. But one thing about the Southern Ocean is, you know, it, it, you've seen it, right? We've both been there and it's it's remote. Not many people actually go there. And so the observations we collect are, are sparse. You know, we're reliant on satellites, maybe for the sea surface temperatures. But the only measurements we get are from basically research ships that are supporting while well, doing science in the Southern Ocean and also going to the, the research bases to resupply the, the resupply them. So um, any observations we, we can get. And, and you, you as a community have been doing that as well for us, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I think that's something that's <clears throat> really changed in the last few years. So 2017, 18, I led Turn the Tide on Plastic in the Volvo Ocean Race. And we were one of the first boats to take data. We did um, the microplastic sampling, which also did the pH, the salinity, the temperature. And we did that all the way around the world on our route and that data became open source, but it's, you're right, it's inaccessible, hostile locations that are really expensive to get to. And if race boats are going there, it's perfect opportunity. And I think we're much more aware of this now and our obligation as guardians of the ocean to kind of do our bit of citizen science and help the research out. So yeah. I think now we're seeing more and more race vessels take, take that on, take that ownership on. Yeah, and Antarctica itself, in terms of the uh, not just the sea ice around Antarctica, but the, the the glaciers and everything else that sat on sat on Antarctica, that, that 
that, that if that melts that contributes to sea level rise you know you're putting more water into the ocean and actually those 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 the ice shelves themselves are one of the tipping points that we that we um have classified you know as a danger to a long-term danger to our planet so there's the argo program that makes observations globally in in our oceans they are it's a big international project so those those argo floats are making measurements every 10 days of the temperature and salinity and they're, they're pretty big because we we deploy those on right. route. we all have a location to deploy them so we're contributing to those uh, stations giving the data back absolutely so we again you know to put them in the water we need uh, your community we need the science community to contribute to that um but we can't actually get under the ice shells themselves. You know, we have systems where we can fly like um, robots underneath them to see what's happening there. But it, it's in a system we need as many observa ocean observations as we can actually get. So more data is valuable. I've got a question about ice because in my first lap around the world, 2004, I didn't see any ice. Going the wrong way, spent a long time in the Southern Ocean. I went down as far as 61 South. Um, and we didn't see any ice. It snowed, but it, there was no ice. The following year, I went round on my own, non-stop. So I got rid of the crew. And I spent three days amongst ice in the Indian Ocean, Southern Indian Ocean. And I just couldn't find a way out. There were icebergs everywhere. And initially, it was quite exciting. I took the photo and the video. And then it becomes draining. I didn't sleep. I didn't eat. I was stressed. They And it took three days until there wasn't something on the radar ahead of me. For, and that water temperature just went up one degree and I was like, I've cracked it. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I've had enough. I want to get off with the penguins. And actually it took some research in from a station in Hobart that explained that an ice shelf of 150 kilometers had broken off and was breaking up. And I was in that debris because I was like, which way is the way out? You know, let, let me get into clear ocean. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm noticing now in races where it's a controlled environment, we have a a barrier like a, a wall that we can't go south of and that's to keep us safe so what they do is the canadian satellite system has a look where the ice significant icebergs or ice activity is and then they put a wall there to prevent us going south of that to keep us safe and that's going further and further north so our trip around the world then geographically gets longer but maybe that's contributing to the change of weather that we're seeing, the wind strength and, you know, keeping us further north than perhaps we would have gone in the past. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right because the ocean's warming. So what happens to the ice shelves themselves is you get warming from underneath, you get changes, you get increased wind speeds so that starts to break the ice up, the, the, the sea ice up. Um, and we are seeing bigger and bigger bits of Antarctica come icebergs. Yeah, it's huge slab. In a way, you can't call them an iceberg because they're huge. Mm. You know, they can be like, like a land of, mass. Yeah, it's like I would say the size of Greater London or something like that can break off Antarctica and come out. And then as it slowly um, uh, moves into warmer waters, as it heads north through the Southern Ocean, it starts to break up. And it's also got um, the sun coming down on it as well. So typically in the in the south atlantic ocean you'll see these icebergs will break up and they'll they tend to move towards south south georgia actually mm -hmm. and then start to break up and that's possibly what you've experienced that was that was the, um the indian ocean wasn't it as well yeah. but but in terms of your challenge so you haven't got a sudden limit you've got to make decisions no right? that's the thing with a speed record there's no control so it's our discretion so we'll need the support oh. of those people that read the satellites and and kind of make a professional safe decision whilst still trying to go yeah. for the shortest distance and the fastest speed yeah so can, can do you have the power to run radars like 24 hours a day to look at the big bits yes and you we can. can have weather support because obviously sailing a multi-hull at that speed is quite an intense environment so you can have assistance of weather routing so yeah. we can have people that aren't tired and emotional in an office with a nice screen and getting the right information yeah. to share because even on our on our on our 100 meter big you know steel bodied ice breaking research ships um if we're in a storm you know big waves were head we're head to wind um and we basically if, if it's dark we have the searchlight if we're further north and in the summer etc if it's dark we'll have searchlights looking for smaller bergy bits because we do still we can have the radar to see the big bits just mm. as you do but the small bits are still a, a danger as well so how would you how would you cope with those well it's that stress level because you know what you see is only a small portion and you know underneath is even more and that that fear whether it's a mammal whether it's a container that floating debris or that ice of what's under the surface of the water is always much bigger. But 
you just kind of have to cross your fingers and just keep going. Yeah. And also in terms of, um, I would say for at least the last decade or more, the sea ice around Antarctica has been, you know, it will go out in their, in their winter. And it's the ice extent has been very consistent. But now we're seeing that that the ice level has actually reduced. So this could be down to, again, the ocean's warming. The winds have changed to start to break that ice edge up. Again, it, it, it's complex. We don't quite know the answer yet or the explanation. Or, and and the main thing is to understand that is to then, uh, in, what's the impact of that on, on yeah. our climate and actually on society? So potentially from what you're saying, if I speak to you next year, if it's <laughs> regressed a little, I can cut the corner a little and reduce my distance. Um, well, perhaps not quite because... As it's breaking up, again, we've got we've got like little bits of ice, icebergs, alleys, these types of things that you're going to have to avoid. So I think it's going to be more of a challenge for you to make those decisions because there's possibly going to be um, possibly going to be more bits breaking off, even though it's perhaps further south. Yeah. There'll be more more bits breaking off, really. OK, good to know. OK, I don't really want to meet an iceberg. So I survived no. the Southern Ocean and we round Cape Horn, notorious Cape Horn, where you've got the whole Southern Ocean hitting that continental shelf and that little gap invariably you always get nailed at Cape Horn or just before, just to give the little sting in the tail that the Southern Ocean reminds you who's in charge. Yeah. Head into the Atlantic and you kind of, in your mind, think, oh, I've, I've cracked it. But actually the reality is there's another 7,000 miles to go and it doesn't get any easier. Now we kind of think of the Atlantic of having a very high confidence in the forecasting because there's a lot of data, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of shipping. You know, your information's really good in that area. But I'm starting to see more and more, and there's a race um, across the Atlantic this year, 2024, that's just had really uncharacteristic weather that hasn't agreed with any forecasts. So the forecast, they're getting the files in every day, but they're looking outside and the cloud and the wind isn't doing what it says. Challenging, right? It's, yes. Perhaps it's a bit more of a level of it for yacht racing now. You know, you, 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 can you go back to using your instincts? But, but anyway, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, is, is it the atmosphere that's becoming more unpredictable? Is it the ocean, the ocean currents? Because I guess you're picking up in the Gulf Stream extensions there, aren't you? Um, so uh, is the, is the Gulf Stream itself become more eddy like? Is it, is it, is it moved north or south? So a little more meandering. It could be, yeah, a little more meandering in the Gulf Stream. So I, in terms of the ocean atmosphere system, I think both of these things um, are becoming, well, the atmosphere perhaps is becoming more unpredictable. And what we're seeing with climate change will be more extremes. And we're seeing that already with, with sort of la uh, more flooding in the UK, larger winter storms are starting to hit. So even in, even in I guess, the summer months is when the, the yacht race, this yacht race yeah. will be happening, yeah. Um, it's becoming you're demonstrating the fact it is becoming more unpredictable as to why um, we have probably have to work with the forecasters to work on that. But it used to be that the forecasts, the weather forecasts only really considered the atmosphere. They didn't think about the ocean at all. And they maybe just about well, the oceans there, you know, we've got sea surface temperatures, but what they found was when they actually put the ocean into the weather forecast, they improved. Okay, so it's a major contributing factor. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, it, it does improve. And so the more observations we can make of the ocean, uh, we can bring these in from satellites, from sea surface temperature measurements, from the Argo program, which we've already mentioned. So it's not just about the surface, it's what's happening underneath and how the currents are changing. Because the Gulf Stream itself, what researchers have found is that on a, on a long, slightly longer time scale, it can actually influence the, the jet stream in the atmosphere. So it, it can, it's not fully controlling it, but it can influence it because you've seen when it starts to buckle yep. uh, and then we have the sort of high pressures coming up or we get more of those sort of Scandinavian or the, those Arctic uh, low pressures coming down. So it's a challenge, yeah. And on my way to get this Gulf Stream where you think warm water, because the speed runs are always in the North Atlantic. It's either from Brazil down to uh, the Cape of Good Hope, that that opportunity to pick up a pressure system and get into the Southern Ocean super fast, that's a really good speed run. Or across the Atlantic where you're in the Gulf Stream, it's flat water and you go really fast. They're the yeah. two places where you get your 24 hour records. But on my way to get there, I often, we have this Sargassum Sea. And one thing that is absolutely agreed upon across all sailors 
is the volume of this weed is increasing like you will not believe like and it's debilitating it gets on your foils on your rudders on your keel slows the boat down and you're having to literally stop get the weed off and go again but it's blankets of it that we're having to go through you know is this just going to get worse can will it change like what what's going on i um will it reduce at the minute well it, i think it's potentially short term it's probably a bit bad news for for you <laughs> you're not helping me here <laughs> i know i know but what we think has happened is so so colleagues here at the university of southampton have done a, quite a lot of work on this sargassum weed because it's not just impacting uh, yacht racing you know the the sargassum is washing up on beaches uh, in, in um, the bahamas for instance so it's problems with tourism because the tourism industry you don't want to sit on on beaches with lots of decaying weed. weed um what we think is happening or what they've they've shown is that the the weed itself uh, the wind patterns have changed slightly so the weed is starting to move that that weed patch is starting to move further south and that wind has basically changed the upwelling so nutrients come from really the deep ocean so that wind change has brought more nutrients up so the weeds, the weed patch itself, the sargassum weed, has then increased because it's got more food. You know, it's it's growing, um, and I think it, it's looking like that's that's going to be sustained for the near future. Okay, that's not good news. I know. Thanks for sharing that. That's yeah. I mean, that's one of our bugbears. It's okay for it to be splashed on deck, but sometimes it's so dense, it's like blanketed, and it's debilitating for the foils and the performance of the boat. And when you're doing a speed record now, that's what I'm thinking about all the time. Yeah. So maybe sat satellite imagery, can that pick it up? And that could help through um, the team ashore? Yeah, maybe with the infrared as well, because we can do that with clouds. So I'm sure it can do that. Uh, does it change the sea surface temperature, having the weed there? Does it change the sea surface temperature? Um, I would say not. I again, it's not completely my field. Mm. Um, it, yeah, But I would say probably not. It, it, it's basically going to sit there but there's more life within it as well you know we got the we've got the eels and things like that yeah. so there's a lot more life associated with it um that's but on, a good thing yeah but on a positive note you know what it's doing is locking away carbon so yeah. we've got this um this blue carbon systems where natural ways to take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it and lock it away and this is one of them where if this weed patch is getting bigger it's taking more of the the carbon from the atmosphere it's quite interesting because this will be the first time that I'm going to do a lap around the world on a boat that is semi-foiling, so out of the water a lot of the time. And although we have three hulls, I've literally only got one in the water driving that's kind of, and the middle hull just touches to be the optimum and the windward hull is above the water. So previously we've had the science doing our bit of citizen science and we can take water samples really easily. Now, actually, the question is when a boat goes that fast, what science can we help with? Because it's really good to be able to help and support the research so that we can be better informed and be safer out there. But it's um, with the speed increase, technology allowing boats to foil and go faster, it actually debilitates our ability to take the science up for you. That's an interesting question. So if you're doing 20, 26 knots plus, you're not going to want to throw a bucket over and collect any water. Or I'm even not going to be able to hold on to it, that's yeah, for sure. Exactly. Um, so maybe within the design systems, we could uh, take an intake and actually just tap off some water from an intake on the hull if there's if there's such a thing would exist on the yacht. Because typically on our ships... We're, well, we're still going to have to make fresh water from our desalinator. So there is an option as we're making water to pre-feed into something that will gather some data. Absolutely then. So we, we could... We could think about a program where we could actually take water samples at specific locations or or regularly and they could be stored on board so we could take that from our intake and we do similar on our ships so we have this water supply that comes in and we measure the sea surface temperatures very close to that inlet because you've got a warm ship and that yeah. you, if you measure it further down the pipe it's going to get warm so there's all these types of things and biases that we have to think about um, but yeah, but we we tap into those supplies to do surface measurements of salinity um, and pH and, and carbon as well. Yeah. Okay. So we can still help with that and contribute to that system. Yes, please. <laughs> no problem at all. It just it's it's strange for me to think of a lap of the planet to be forty days, uh, you know, and a few hours. You know, if it could be twenty two hours fifty nine minutes, I'm still happy. It only has to be a second quicker. But um, 
to date a female crew hasn't done it we're hoping to change that next year so even if it's not the outright record we're still set a benchmark um time and we could always go for a second lap if we uh because you always <laughs> learn and you can always get better yeah yeah um but it's that million dollar question the technology the boats are getting faster technology is getting you know we've got the hydrodynamics the aerodynamics as they're lifting out the water more but it's whether the weather and the climate and the ocean is going to allow us to make that possible i think 2017 when that record was set was like the magic year a golden year many records were set that year and there's a reason it's held for so long yes technology hasn't quite supported the increase in speed on some of the boats but I just don't think the weather's the same. So the million dollar question will be whether it's even possible. Try, go for it, go for it and see, you know, I think. Have you changed the technology of the boat as well? So you've mentioned the foiling part a lot. Was the original yacht foiling as well? Yeah, it so um, we haven't done too much of a change because it's tried and tested. It's actually had the record three times this boat. So she's a veteran, but she knows what she's doing. So we kind of went with something tried and tested. So we don't have to worry about ourselves. Yeah. Um, and then we can evolve. But uh, I think one thing that we didn't have, he had a T rudder, so the ability for the rudder to add lift as well. He didn't like it, but we don't really have much reference of whether we prefer it or not. So maybe we'll just go with that and that will add that extra yeah. kind of, it's a point one. It's all the small increments that will make a difference. You've launched the boat recently, haven't you? She's got shakedown things, trials yes. and et cetera. Yeah, to, we, to got, we got a nice kind of year and a quarter to uh, get our heads around the game and uh, get the boat performing. And we know what that consistent average speed needs to be to make that record. Good luck. Thank you. Well, I'll be asking for your help and support. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed today's episode of the podcast. To ensure you don't miss out on future episodes, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next time.